Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace, celebrating 20 years of discipling others through Karis Bible College worldwide. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I am continuing a teaching on the effects of praise, and this week is going to be my final week teaching on this. I've got this book entitled The Effects of Praise. I've got a CD and a DVD teaching on this. And we've also been offering the praise and worship uh, from our Karis Bible College choir. And I tell you, that's powerful. But praise is just a vital part of our relationship with God. And I think that too often people neglect this area. Most people feel that praise is something that they would like to do, but it's kind of a byproduct of what's going on in your life. If everything is going good, well then, yeah, you'll praise God. But really it's opposite that. Praise is more like the engine instead of the caboose on the train. Praise drives things. Praise affects you. It affects the devil. And what I've been talking about this week is how praise affects God. And I think that most people do not understand, like it says in Psalms chapter 22, that God inhabits the praises of His people, that He dances over us with joy. God gets blessed when we praise Him and thank Him. It ministers unto God. Now, those statements that I've said right there are probably not the way that most people would describe praise. Sometimes they will recognize praise is good for you. It changes your attitude. It, it changes your focus and puts your attention on the promises instead of the promise. Some people recognize that praise will be strength against the enemy and the avenger, that it stops the devil in his tracks. But there are very few Christians that understand that praise ministers to God. I was using a verse yesterday out of Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. It says, As they ministered to the Lord and fast and in pray, then the word of the Lord came unto them about separating Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto God had called them. And I was talking about that most people think that ministry is all people oriented. It's all, you know, you've got to go preach to somebody. You've got to go serve them. You've got to give money to some benevolence thing. You've got to be doing something. That's what most people see as ministering. But in Acts chapter 13, it says they fasted and prayed and ministered unto God. They weren't out serving other people. They weren't touching other people. They weren't holding the service they were just worshiping God, thanking Him, praising Him for His goodness, and it ministered unto God. And then I connected that with Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. This is what the 24 elders in heaven are saying right now. Revelation 4 is a glimpse into heaven and what's going on, and there's just constant praise and worship going up to God. And here's what they're saying. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That means that the original purpose was for God's pleasure, the purpose that still exists today, even after sin, and even after so many things have changed, so many things in our world today. We are still created for his pleasure. God loves you, not just what you can do for him, but God loves you and He wants relationship with you. You know, this places a value on us that most people just really haven't understood. I think that a lot of people, this was the way I was, that God is, is our creator. He's almighty and He created us. And when this world went into chaos, when mankind sinned against Him, and there was this broken relationship because of it, God felt responsible. God felt obligated as our creator to do something. And so he offered salvation to us through Jesus. But I saw it more as kind of a debt, an obligation, a responsibility that God had to perform for the human race. But, you know, it's so clear like John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God didn't just save us out of a sense of obligation, out of a debt, a responsibility or something, but He is passionate about us. We were created 
for His pleasure. That was the original purpose. And even though we have fallen and we aren't the people that God created us to be, it's still His purpose to create us for His pleasure. God wants relationship with us. That's powerful. You know, God fellowshiped with Adam and Eve every evening in the cool of the day. He would go meet with them. He had an entire universe to run. I'm sure there's other things that God could have been doing, and yet God meant with Adam and Eve every single day. And through the New Testament, it says that He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us always. The Lord inhabits us. He dwells in our heart. God wants relationship with us. He created us for relationship. And I think that to a large degree, we have substituted service for a relationship. God wants you. You know, when I married my wife, I remember when I proposed to Jamie, I said, Jamie, I want you to share the rest of my life with me. And that's what I wanted. I wanted someone that would go with me through everything that I was going through. At the time, I didn't know what all that meant, but I asked Jamie to just share the rest of my life with me because I wanted relationship with someone. I wanted someone to share life with and all of these things. Now, at the time, I honestly didn't even know if Jamie could cook. I didn't ask her if she could cook. She never cooked me a meal. I didn't marry Jamie because I needed a cook. It turns out that Jamie is a great cook. And Jamie cooks good food. And and you know what? I appreciate it. But I didn't marry her to get a cook. It turns out that Jamie keeps a very clean house. You know, I've been in some people's houses where you can't even step on the carpet. There's so many clothes and there's just stuff on the floor. And the house is dirty. Boy, Jamie keeps a clean house. She's got a little bear at the entrance to our uh, house that says bare feet only. And I'm supposed to take my boots, my shoes off and, you know, not walk on the carpet. Now, I don't do it uh, very well. I don't conform to that. But I mean, that's a reflection of how that she's so organized. She keeps everything clean. Jamie keeps all of her spices alphabetized. I mean, she is a perfectionist, an organizational person which is a great balance to me because I'm just the opposite of it. So together we make a good couple. And I appreciate Jamie cleaning my clothes and cleaning the house and cooking for me and all of those things. And in their place, did you know that that really blesses me and it uh, enhances our relationship? I appreciate what she does. But I didn't marry Jamie to get a housekeeper. I married Jamie because I loved Jamie. I wanted Jamie to be with me. I wanted relationship with her. And the very things that bless me when they're done in their proper place would cease to be a blessing if she loved that house more than she loved me. If she got to where she would yell and say, take off your boots, how dare you step on my carpet. If I ever thought that she loved the carpet and keeping the carpet clean more than she loved me, the very things that are now a blessing to me in their place would, would start to be something that I hate. And you know, this is exactly what the Lord said in the Old Covenant in so many places. He commanded sacrifices. He commanded these feasts and all of these rituals that He instituted. And they were supposed to be expressions of the people's love and dependence upon God. And in the proper place, it's just fine. But when the minor prophets came along after the entire nation of Israel had basically rebelled at God and walked away from Him, they were still going through the motions and they were still offering daily sacrifices and coming to the feast. And they were doing some of the things that God commanded them to do. But the Lord said, like in Psalms chapter 50, He says, that I am sick of your feast and all of these things. They are a stink in my nostril, these sacrifice. And he says, away with them. I cannot abide these kind of things. Now, these were things that he told them to do. These were things that were done under his instructions. But when they became a substitute for a relationship with God, instead of an expression of relationship with God, they ceased to bless him. And he even said, I'm tired of them. Get your sacrifices away from me. See, that's what I was talking about. I married Jamie for a relationship with Jamie. And the fact that she does things for me and serves me and blesses me 
It's wonderful, and I appreciate it in their proper place. But if she ever got to where she was more concerned about her food, about her house, about her clothes, about all of these things, instead of doing it because she loves me and a response to me, instead, if she substituted that and got to where that was more important than me, then those things would cease to be a blessing to me. And I'm telling you, with many of us, This is exactly what has happened in our relationship. We have gotten to where we are serving God and doing things for God, but we aren't really in relationship with God. You've always got to keep the proper order. You know, I remember that there was a time that I was actually reading the Word, and I, you know, I don't do it, I'm not doing it this year, but typically I will read through a Bible reading program, and I've read through the Bible as many as two and three times in one year. And when you do that, you have to do four chapters a day to read through the Bible in one year. And when you're reading two and three times, it can be on up to, you know, uh, what would that be, three times that, uh, 12 chapters a day you have to read. And if I'm in transit on an airplane or something and can't read, well, then it can be, you know, 24 chapters you've got to read. And so I was reading through my Bible readings one time and I was, uh, I, I kind of go through the motions and say, Father, I want you to speak to me. I'm believing that this is giving me revelation and I'll pray things like that. And so I started reading, and I mean on like the second or the third verse, God started speaking to me. I started getting revelation. God was communing with me. And I kind of sat back, took my eyes off of the Scripture, and I started meditating on what God was saying to me. And then I caught myself. And I thought, man, I still have 12 chapters to go today. And so I just shelved that thought, pushed it out of my mind, and I went back to reading the Scripture. And I was only a couple of verses down there and the Lord spoke to me and He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm reading the Word. And the Lord said, and why do you read the Word? And I said, well, so that you could speak to me, so that I could hear your voice. And then it just got quiet. The Lord didn't say anymore. And I got to thinking about what does all of this mean? And I realized that I was reading the Bible so that I could have relationship with the Lord, that God could speak to me, that I could get revelation. And on the second verse, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me and and communicating some things to me. But because I had 12 more chapters to read, I basically rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I pushed God out of the way. In a sense, it's like saying, God, how dare you interrupt me? I'm reading the Bible. I've got 12 chapters I've got to read so I can check my list off and do these things. You see what I'm saying? That the purpose of reading the Word isn't so that you can accomplish, you know, reading through the Bible in one year so that you can meet your goal. It is so that you can open your heart to the Lord and listen to God and let God speak to you. And if God goes to speaking to you on the very first verse of your Bible reading and if God is saying something to you, you ought to forget the rest of the Bible reading and let God say what He's got to say. Now again, I am not saying that we don't you know, have a Bible reading program to read through, but I'm saying we, we, we should be doing these things not in order to say, well, I've read through the Bible and for your own gratification and it's not so that you can just swell your mind and and, and come up with some understanding about God. It is so that you can know God. God reveals Himself to us through the Scripture. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. He changes our heart and that ought to be the goal. It's all about relationship with God and not just accomplishing something, but we have become so goal oriented. We want to read through the Bible in one year that we, so you, I'm not saying that this always happens, but you can get to where you actually, your Bible reading becomes a hindrance to your personal relationship with God. God has wanted to say something to you through the very first verse you read and you got four more chapters to go and you won't let God get a word in edgewise because you've got to finish your Bible reading. You know, prayer is all about relationship with God. Now, again, there are multiple purposes of prayer. We can intercede for other people. We can make requests known and we can do things. And so there are multiple purposes. But the primary purpose 
of prayer is for relationship with God, to express your love to Him and have God communicate unto you and speak to you. And I could spend more time on that. I'm going to teach on prayer here uh, in the not too distant future. And so I'll be expounding on that. But prayer is about relationship with God. But did you know I have been guilty of this? I'm sure that some of you have too, that I just decided that I was going to pray an hour a day. I heard somebody talk about that. And I thought if an hour a day was good, two hours would be even better. And so before I got married, when I was still young and just really getting started in the Lord, I made a decision that I was going to pray at least two hours a day. And I, I remember the very first time I did it, I, I prayed. I s- prayed for the whole world. I said everything I thought that needed to be said, and I figured I'd probably gone an hour. And I looked down, and I had gone five minutes. And it seemed like those first two hours were just an eternity. And it got to where it was hard. And I remember I had a certain time set down. I forget exactly now what it was, but I think it was like 7 to 9 o'clock or something like that. And I would set a timer to to let me know it was time to go pray. I would set a timer so that I'd know when I'd prayed two hours and things like this. And I remember I did this for months and months. And there was good things that came out of it. But at the same time, I, I remember one day that I was studying the Word and God was speaking to me and I was getting revelation and the Word of God was just blessing me and I was having an awesome time with the Lord. The Holy Spirit was giving me revelation and it was just, I think the most exciting thing that has ever happened in my life is for the Word of God to come alive to me and have God Almighty talk to me through His Word. And I was just having an awesome time in the Word of God. And then this timer went off And I realized it was getting close to the time that I had to go in and spend two hours praying. And I just started dreading it. And I was praying and I was thinking, God, I hate to admit this, but you know it anyway, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. But, you know, it's 645 and about 15 minutes before this two-hour prayer time, I start dreading it. I said, I'm just having a wonderful time praying and fellowshipping with you and studying the Word, but then I'll have to go in and I'll have to start going through my prayer list and praying for all of these things and doing all of this. And I said, I am having more fun. I'm enjoying you more now than when I get into this prayer. And I I said, I hate to admit it, but I go to dreading this prayer time at least 15 minutes before it's time to go pray. And when I was expressing this to the Lord, I believe the Lord really spoke back to me and he said, Andrew, don't feel bad. He says, I start dreading it 30 minutes before the prayer time. (laughs) And you know what? I realized that, wait a minute, if I'm dreading this prayer time and if God is dreading this prayer time, well, then why am I doing it? And it was just a religious calisthenic. It was just a religious exercise. It was something that I was doing to soothe my conscience, to make me feel like I was doing enough and I was seeking the Lord enough to please him And there was probably some benefit to it in the sense that I wasn't watching television. I wasn't doing something else that I could have been doing. My attention and my thoughts were about the Lord. So I'm not saying it was useless, but I am saying that, you know, we just sometimes get to where we have these things that we've got to do for God. And it's not about our personal relationship with God. And I know I've been guilty of this. There, there have been times, I remember one time in Mesa, Arizona, that I had been ministering for weeks, not just in Mesa, but other places. And I was having three services a day. I came to Mesa, Arizona, and I was holding three services a day. And during the afternoon message, I was preaching from the book of Romans. And what I was saying was accurate and it was true. It was things that God had shown me. But you know what? I had gotten so busy just doing and ministering to other people that it had been literally days or weeks before I had sat down and studied the Word for myself and just fellowshipping with the Lord. It had been days or weeks since I had just prayed to the Lord. I was busy day and night doing things, not sinful things. I was ministering to people, but I was doing all of these things instead of having a personal relationship with the Lord. And because of it, I was so... Uh, burned out. I was so, I'd given out so much that I honestly thought to myself, if I wasn't the one preaching, 
I would quit and walk out of this place right now. And I realized that here I was doing all of the right things, but it was, I wasn't in communion with the Lord. It was just like a machine or something. And I was, I was a human doing, but not a human being. I wasn't ministering to the Lord. And I made some adjustments. That's been 20 or 30 years ago. And I made some adjustments that I just will not put out so much without refilling myself and being in communion with the Lord. I was just talking to Dick and D. Eastman yesterday, I had lunch with them, Every Home for Christ, and they were talking about, you know, they travel. And I said, how do you do all of this travel? And one of the things that they do is that they will schedule two or three extra days when they travel overseas and do these things, and it's just days of rest. And they will sit there and they spend time together and they spend time with the Lord. And I tell you, there's great wisdom in that. But it's all about personal relationship with the Lord. And praise, it, it is a weapon against the devil. It'll stop Satan in his tracks. Praise will touch you. It'll change your focus. It helps you. But most people don't understand that praise ministers to God. It blesses God. This is why you were created, was to be a blessing to God. And if we aren't entering His gates with thanksgiving, if we aren't being thankful for all that He's done for us, if we aren't praising Him, well, then in that sense, God is missing something that He needs. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that God is sitting on the throne, sucking His thumb, pouting, having problems because we aren't being thankful and praising Him and and fellowshipping with Him. But I am saying that God created us for relationship, not just service. He could have created another angel. He could have created something mechanical to get what you know needs to be done, done. But He created us for fellowship, for His pleasure. And God desires that. In that sense, God needs our fellowship with Him. He craves it. He desires it. He inhabits the praises of His people. And brothers and sisters, when you and I are not praising God, when we are not glorifying God, in that sense, God's needs are not being met. And I know that even saying this, a lot of people think, well, God doesn't have any needs. He's self-contained. Well, God, because of His great love for us, He has put Himself into a position where He's vulnerable. I'm, again, not saying that God is somehow or another uh, you know, depressed or, or defeated or has any of those kind of things that we talk about when we say that we have a need that is unmet. But God needs, God desires, God wants relationship with you. And God is pleased when you just thank Him, when you praise Him. He inhabits your praises. And so I want to encourage you that this is how praise affects God. I've got some other things I'm going to share with you that I believe will really, really help you to understand this, but God longs for relationship with you, not just service from you, but relationship with you. Service is not a substitute for relationship. So this is what we're talking about this week, how praise affects God. And I've got this book entitled The Effects of Praise. I've also got CDs and DVDs. And then we have this CD and DVD of our praise and worship group that would help you to get into a place where you're just ministering to God. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. Through you, blind eyes are opened. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. The Lord has blessed us in many, many ways, but I tell you, one of the most exciting things is the praise and worship that we have at our Karis Bible College. It is second to none. The best is yet to come. And we now have put out a CD and a DVD, and the title of this CD is The Best is Yet to Come. That's a saying of mine, and Daniel Amstutz, who is the music praise and worship leader as well as the head of our worship uh, school 
in the third year, uh, wrote a song about that, The Best Is Yet To Come. This is powerful, and I just wanted to advertise this to you and let you know about it. Uh, they are tremendous. I tell you, if you would get these, you would not be disappointed. It would help you to get into the presence of the Lord and worship Him in spirit and in truth. So check this out. The best is yet to come. Andrew's complete teaching series titled The Effects of Praise is available on either CD or DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Or you can get this teaching in book form. Each is available for a gift of any amount. During this teaching series, we're also offering the most recent release from Karis Bible College Worship Ministry. The Best is Yet to Come features 14 tracks recorded live with the entire student body, including original songs written by Karis Bible College School of Worship students. You can get it on CD or on a DVD that includes lyrics you can use at your church or Bible study. Each is available for a gift of any amount. Go to awmi.net and click on Today's TV Offer to see all the ways you can get the products offered on today's program. The third audio teaching in today's series is titled, The Effect of Praise on the Lord. It's available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD free of charge. We'd also like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, Don't Limit God for a Gift of Any Amount. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website at awmi.net. While you're there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. The lines are busy. Remember, you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We invite you to join Andrew on April 9th through the 11th for our Gospel Truth Seminar in Orlando, Florida at the Hilton Orlando. As far as the experience with the Gospel Truth Seminar, it's just been absolutely amazing. The things that you put into the Gospel never leave your life. It just enters into your future where it grows and it multiplies. We were at an Andrew conference last year and I was dealing with these feelings of not being able to have a child. And uh, now this year, the same time, it's exactly from April to April. I now have Adoniah uh, from the time when I came to Andrew's conference and he spoke that word about a child being born and being around the same time of year. Log on to awmi.net and click on the meetings tab to register online.